Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I am honored and pleased to introduce today's speaker, the Permanent Observer of Palestine to the United Nations, Ambassador Riyad Mansour. During the past several years, the City Club has hosted several forums on the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. There are, I think we would all acknowledge, few subjects that are more important or that evoke more passionate and intense reactions than this profound issue. We witnessed that passion and intensity in the debate over the Iranian nuclear accord, and in the past few months have heard presidential candidates question the Obama administration, and sometimes even each other, in the Republican debate on whether the United, Sta on whether the United States has wavered from its longstanding commitment to Israel. Last September, the United Nations overwhelmingly, over the objection of the United States, Israel, and six other countries, approved a motion allowing the Palestinian flag to be flown in front of United Nations buildings. And this past January, France's foreign minister, minister stated that France would recognize a Palestinian state if Israel and the Palestinians fail to reach an accord. So in this context, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Mansour to share his uniquely and deeply informed perspectives with us. Dr. Mansour was born to a refugee family that lived in the city of Ramallah in the occupied West Bank. He has been engaged in Palestinian diplomatic service since 1983 at the Permanent Observer Mission of the Palestinian Liberation Organization to the United Nations. After the Palestinian Authority applied for official UN membership in 2011, and was granted non-member observer status in 2012, Dr. Mansour became its ambassador and permanent observer. He also serves as Palestine's non-resident ambassador to Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic. Dr. Mansour has published and researched extensively on the Palestinian community in the United States. He has worked in the private and public sector as a consultant, diplomat, diplomat and as an adjunct professor. And he has Ohio ties. In fact, he was telling us that he feels like he's back home today. So that was kind of cool to hear. So he obtained his Master of Science in Education Counseling from Youngstown State University and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Counseling from the University of Akron with a concentration in urban studies and emphasis on research methodologies. So ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome Ambassador Riyad Mansour. Thank you very much, Paul, for this introduction. And I also want to express my gratitude to the City Club of Cleveland for inviting me to be with you today and to share with you the view of the Palestinian people of how possibly we could have peace with our neighbors, the State of Israel, and save the two-state solution. But before I say that, you know, Cleveland is an important place to me. My father was in this area since after the war. When he came, he was among the lucky ones who was able to come uh, through a lottery system in which tens of thousands of Palestine refugees applied to come to the United States looking for jobs and to uh, look after their families. And at that time, they used to have a lottery system to only select 200. My father was among the 200 lucky ones who were able to secure a residency card and to come to the United States of America, and he lived in this area. Specifically, he lived in Youngstown, Ohio, in which he was a steel worker looking after his family. So I am proud that I am a son of a Palestine refugee, I am a son of a steel worker from around here, and I am proud that I am the ambassador of the State of Palestine at the United Nations. Of course, I came, the first city I came to in the United States was Cleveland. I lived in Berea because my brother, two brothers actually, older than me, lived in that area. One of them used to be an engineer with NASA, the other one, worked with the state of Ohio as a social worker in Cleveland. 
So after a few days of my arrival, I started working at Southwest Community Hospital in Berea as an orderly because I wanted to become a medical doctor. My father told me, you have to become a medical doctor. So I thought <laughs> to, to work in a hospital, that would help the endeavor. So I was considering going to Berea, the, co the college. But of course, we did not agree on the terms of the scholarship that they would give me. I was young and foolish. I should have accepted what they offered me. But I was more compelled that I wanted to go to state universities because I wanted to go to things related to the working people. So I decided to go to Youngstown State University. But Cleveland left marks in my heart and in my mind. And I, st I still love Cleveland, and I'm loyal to your, to your teams, the Browns, the Cavaliers, <laughs> the Indians. I'm a Buckeye. I follow, you know, that, uh, you know, these teams. It just, I don't know, it seems to me that those who live in Cleveland for a while, regardless of where they go, they're still loyal to Cleveland, Ohio. So Cleveland is like a second home to me, and I'm so proud and honored that you invited me to come and speak uh, with you today about a very important subject. Having said all these things, uh, let me just share with you that the Palestine-Israeli conflict is a very complicated one. And if we do not have peace, then this conflict could drag for a longer period of time and could have a flavor that would bring more tragedies to both sides and to the larger region, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the entire Middle East. And by that I mean because of extremism that are unfolding in our region that is also covering itself with some religious flavor. And this extremism also we see it in the Israeli side by those who are more or less hijacking the Zionist secular thinking into more of extre extremism with religious flavors, whether they are in the government or in the settlement movement. And they are trying to precipitate with extremists on our side to have an explosion over Jerusalem uh, under the banner of religious rights for this group or that group. And if we descend to that kind of confrontation over Jerusalem, if the extremists in both sides pull us into that kind of confrontation, then that would be the biggest gift given to ISIS. They never dreamt of having such a gift to be provided to them. We all know that ISIS, because of many reasons, including lack of justice for the Palestinian people, which they use it as part of their recruiting uh, mechanism or propaganda, they succeeded in recruiting 25,000 youngsters, young men and women from the United States, from Canada, from Europe, from Australia. If God forbids confrontation over Jerusalem to erupt on religious grounds, it would, not, it would be very possible that maybe 250,000 will be recruited to go and respond to the call of saving Jerusalem. So this is the situation that we are passing through in these days. Therefore, what should we do? From our side as Palestinians, we made significant and historic concessions. When we accepted to establish our state on 22% of historic Palestine, which is less than half of what is available to us under Resolution 181, the Partition Plan Resolution of 1947, which was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, which many Israeli officials consider it as the birth certificate of the State of Israel. That resolution called for the formation of two states approximately in equal part, almost 50-50. Our state, it was slightly lower than uh, 50%. So for us to accept to establish a state on 
of historic Palestine constituting the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip is a remarkable transformation of our political thinking into the direction of realism and in accepting the two-state solution, meaning one state uh, came into being in 1948 and our state recently declared its independence, but the land of our state is under occupation. We believe this formula, although it was painful to us, the Palestinians, and we are still looking for partners in the Israeli side to realize the, the historical significance of this compromise that the Palestinian people and their leadership have you know, accepted, have developed, and are willing and still willing to live with this kind of compromise. I believe that if Israeli leaders and the Israeli society do not also transform, transform themselves into accepting this compromise, as for example reflected in the Arab Peace Initiative adopted in 2002 in the summit of the Arab uh, uh, heads of states in Beirut, in which it calls for Israel to withdraw from the land that they occupied in 1967 in exchange of the Arab nations and the Muslim nations, the 57 of them, recognizing and normalizing the, relation, the relationship with Israel. Until now, there are no Israeli leaders who are ready and willing to work with us in the actualization of this Arab Peace Initiative, which is on the table, and we are committed to it, and we are willing to work with Israeli leaders if they are ready and willing to work with us on the actualization of this uh, peace initiative. So therefore, from our side, we made the big concessions. We signed in front of the White House, in spite of the fact that we had internal discussions and disagreement, but nevertheless, our leadership, the late Chairman Arafat, signed with the late Prime Minister of Israel, Rabin, the Accords of Oslo in front of the White House and the recognition of the State of Israel because we were asked to recognize the State of Israel and we did. But unfortunately, an Israeli terrorist, Jewish terrorist, assassinated Rabin, which affected the whole process in a very negative way. And after we signed the Oslo Agreement, and engage on the Israeli side with a bilateral negotiation for more than 23 years, our situation today is worse than the situation that existed when we signed these agreements. Particularly here, I'm referring to the colonization or the settlement enterprise, in which there are today hundreds of settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory and outposts and outposts from the point of view of the Israeli legal system are illegal. And the population of the settlement uh, enterprise is about 600,000 who are living on different parts of the occupied land of the state of Palestine. This reality, as it continues, it is making the two-state solution next to impossible to be accomplished. And if extremists on the Israeli side include the settlers. They keep pushing the envelope that they want to take more land, to build more settlements, to expand the existing settlements. In reality, they are destroying the two-state solution and creating a reality of a one-state solution. And a reality of one-state solution, I know that the majority will be Palestinian Arabs and the Jews will be minority, but also I know that the leaders in Israel are not uh, accepting this eventuality in order to allow that country to become so democratic, one man, one vote, and equal rights for all the citizens of that state. So then what will they be pulling us to? They will be pulling us into a direction of an apartheid state, which we all know that the Jewish conscious of, be, of, of supporting justice in my opinion, cannot live with offering the Palestinian people to live in an apartheid state. Having said all these things, then what is the best solution? The best solution is to separate, to have two states living side by side next to each other, 
with respect and with accepting each other. And I believe if we separate and we have the independence of our state, the state of Palestine, living in peace and harmony next to the state of Israel, then we will begin a new chapter in our lives, in our relationship as two equal states, although not equal in size, but equal in terms of their sovereignty and independence. And if we have these two states, independent living next to each other, and to begin to normalize the relationship with them, I believe that they could possibly do great things, not only for the Palestinian people and the Arab people, the, I mean, and, and the Israelis, but it they will be able to provide so many great things for the entire Middle East and beyond. In this connection, let us review the, the, uh, the, the experience of France and Germany. France and Germany, during the last 100 years, especially during World War I and World War II, they killed from each other during these two big wars more than all the people that were killed in all wars since the beginning of humanity. But during the last 25 years, these two countries are constituting the pillars of building the European Union, meaning they are concentrating not on the negative things, not on the bloody past, but on the present and the future and what they could do in order to build a new experience in Europe through the European Union of galvanizing the political and the economic power of 28 states in Europe, and these two countries are the leaders of this exercise. So if Germany and France can do things of that magnitude, if we have peace with our neighbors, the Israelis, on the basis of allowing our state to be independent on the borders of 1967 with East Jerusalem as our capital, and to find a just solution to the refugee question on the basis of international law and UN resolutions, then we will begin a new chapter in our relationship which we could do remarkable things for the two states, for the two people, and for the entire region. And I sincerely believe that. Now, where do we stand in terms of the negotiation? We tried the bilateral negotiation for 23 years. When you have one country that dominates the other one, occupies it, very powerful, in that is Israel, in comparison to the Palestinians, we from the Palestinian side, we were negotiating in good faith, but we were the weaker side. Israeli side, they were negotiating most of the times and not in good faith because they were creating illegal things on the ground, particularly settlements. So therefore, to continue this kind of negotiation, it is not recipe for peace, but it is a recipe for the continuation of the conflict. If the Israeli side wants truly to have peace with us on the basis of withdrawing from the land that they occupied in 1967 in exchange of peace from us and the Arabs and the Muslims, then they have to send, before sending the signal to the Palestinian people, they have to send the correct sig signal to the Israeli public. Uh, what is the correct signal? To stop settlement activities because it is illegal and destroying the two-state solution. So if they stop while we're negotiating this illegal behavior, then they will be sending a very effective message to the Israeli public, get ready, we are going to separate, we are going to withdraw. But uh, while we are negotiating, you continue building settlement, expanding existing one, then the signal that you are sending to the public in Israel, you don't want to withdraw. So if they don't want to withdraw and they want to negotiate with us peace, then what are we negotiating? We are wasting time and they think they can create all the illegal realities, on, uh, illegal realities on the ground and they think that Palestinian people will vanish or will forget about their struggle. That is not gonna happen. So, since this method of negotiation did not produce what we hoped that it would, <coughs> now there is a new uh, 
ideas uh, being uh, tested in our region, ideas of a collective processes, such as the one uh, with regard to the Iranian file, in which five plus one very important countries engaged Iran on an agreement of, <coughs> of, of uh, more or less dismantling their nuclear program in exchange of putting an end to the blockade, the economic blockade against Iran and accepting Iran in the, uh, in the community of nations and to allow Iran to thrive economically and in so many different fields. And this, uh, 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 this method, which President Barack Obama played a leading role in it, it's a peaceful method, a diplomatic method, and it seems that that method is working. Another method similar to it, it, still it is not finished, it is another collective process involving several countries that succeeded in having uh, the Geneva One agreement on the Syrian file, followed by the Vienna One agreement, the Vienna Two agreement, and more meetings in Geneva on the Syrian file in which there are support group of many countries and trying to bring the two, uh, uh, co two sides to the conflict in Syria to resolve this tragedy through a peaceful method. So if we have these two examples that are promising, one is produced positive results, the other one potentially could possibly resolve this tragedy in Syria peacefully, then we believe that this method should be also utilized in order to help us and to help the Israeli sides among common friends <coughs> to them and to us, including the P5 in the Security Council, uh, it's a certain number of Arab countries that are very relevant to the conflict, such as Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and maybe other Jordan, and certain number of countries in Europe, Japan, Brazil, along with the Israeli and the Palestinian side. So if we have a collective process of this magnitude, in which people will be helping the two sides to reach peace on all final status issues, on borders, Jerusalem, refugees, settlements, water, and security, and those can help us because when we are negotiating alone, and one is dominating and one is weak, it is not possible, we tried it. We couldn't reach an agreement because we are not capitulating as Palestinians and the Israelis are not showing any sign of readiness and willingness to withdraw from the occupied Palestinian territory. So if we have common friends that will be in the same place negotiating with us in a collective way to reach an agreement on all these issues, then there is a higher chance of reaching an agreement. And if we have an agreement with all these countries in the same process, those countries will guarantee the implementation of whatever we agree to. Because take Europe, for example. Europe is saying that we will give you <coughs> an incentive uh, package if you reach peace. That could be $50 billion to address many issues, including the refugees. Uh, you look at uh, Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. They say that if you have peace, we will be involved in the reconstruction of the Palestinian society and to address issues that need to be addressed. You take Japan, you take the European countries who are giving us money in order to sustain us while we are living under occupation. But if we have peace, they will give large amount of money to address the issues of, uh, of what is required to implement uh, the, uh, the peace agreement. A country that is taking a lead in this regard is France. Because France proposed uh, almost a month ago uh, the idea of convening an international conference. And the idea of convening an international conference is basically a collective process. And they want to start with uh, the meeting of uh, a support group. And the support group could be the P5, some European countries, Arab countries, and others. 
they told us, the French, that in the initial stage, Israel and Palestine will not participate. But maybe in June, July, there will be the international conference, and Palestine and Israel will participate in this international conference. So if this collective process to move forward, learning from all the experiences in the past, including the Annapolis conference, and more importantly, the Madrid first conference, in which there was a collective process. If all of us are serious about peace, I believe we should put our heads together in order to allow the French ideas to have feet and to stand on their feet and to become reality. In this connection, we are saying, since all members of the Security Council are saying that settlements are illegal, illegitimate, and the main obstacle to peace. We are saying let us have a resolution as soon as possible in the Security Council calling on Israel to stop settlement activities because this is the main threat against the two-state solution. And if we succeed in having a resolution before the departure of the current U.S. administration, then we will send the correct signal to everyone, including the Palestinians and the Israelis, that there is a will in the international among the international community to act collectively around an issue there is unanimity in characterizing it as illegal, illegitimate, and obstacle to peace, and therefore that that would be the big test for whether we truly want the French initiative to move forward and to become a serious uh, initiative. We are committed to that as Palestinians, although the French are still consulting and they don't have complete clarity as to the details of their ideas. And they say that let us work in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, listening to everyone. And after we listen to everyone, maybe we will articulate the details of that uh, proposition. What is really significant about the French thinking is a new thinking among the Europeans. The old thinking among the Europeans was, America leads, we follow. And America decided not to lead because of many reasons, including election. The French are saying, we the European take the lead along with the Arabs and the Palestinians, and perhaps we could succeed in pulling the Americans to be along with us. And we sincerely hope that that would be the case. Frankly speaking, if this U.S. administration does not play with all the other partners in order to put the, the train of peace on the right track very soon in the next few months and before they leave office, so that whoever inherit the administration in Washington, D.C. after the election to be able to continue the process and the movement of this train if we put it in the right path. But if we cave in to the pressure from those who are saying, let's not do anything, and transfer the whole file to the next administration, I am afraid that coming the end of this year, that the scenario that I started with about the possibility of an explosion on religious grounds over Jerusalem might be our fate. And I sincerely hope that it will not be that. And in order to avoid it, we have all <coughs> need to work collectively in order to help all these ideas, French ideas, European ideas, Arab ideas, Palestinian ideas, the peace camp inside Israel ideas, and other you know, manifestations inside Israel, and to hopefully convince Washington DC and the administration uh, to really converge all of our efforts together so that we can open door for a meaningful process that would lead in relatively short period of time to the end of the Israeli occupation that started in 1967 that will allow for the independence of our state and therefore to be able to save the two-state solution which is so far is the best solution for us and for the Israeli side. We are committed to this process. We are looking for partners in the Israeli side we are looking for help in Washington, D.C., and you are in a very important place. 
Many of you are connected with people of decision-making magnitude. We need your help. Help us to move in the direction of peace. Help us to move in the direction of reasonableness. Help us in order to convince Washington not to ignore this subject this year, but to be a player. And help us also with Israel to come into reason. Let's look in a practical way for having peace, not to be fixated in fear, antagonism, hatred, incitement that will push the envelope of extremism and to the tragic situation like burning alive of a toddler by the name of Dawabshi and his family or burning alive another kid from Beit Hamina by the name of Abu Khdir. These are dark chapters in our relationship. We need to look for hope. We need to look for peace. We need to give the Palestinian youth hope. Hope by ending the occupation. Hope by having peace. But hope by having independence. Hope by providing them jobs. Hope for looking for the future to live in their own independent state. And all of your help is appreciated. And I thank you very much for inviting me here today and to share these thoughts with you. And I will look for uh, your questions and I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you very much, Paul. Today we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Ambassador Riyad Mansour, a permanent observer of Palestine to the United Nations. Our listening mode is about to convert to an active mode in our traditional Q&A session. And we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, we have students seated here from Hawkins School to my right, uh, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. And if you would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will endeavor to work it into the program. Now, as promised, it's time to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We want to encourage you to ask questions, as many as possible, to keep them brief, to please, please keep them phrased actually as questions. Holding the microphones today are City Club content associate Teddy Eisenberg and City Club marketing and outreach fellow Faye Walker. First question, please. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. Good afternoon. Um, what, would, what would you suggest to the current U.S. presidential candidates the best approach to resolving the Israeli and Palestine conflict in the region? And what should the U.S. role be? The United States of America is a very powerful country. And uh, I listened very uh, closely to the State of the Union of President Barack Obama. He said, among other things, he said that if you want to resolve a global issue, you don't go to Moscow, you don't go to Beijing, you come to Washington, D.C. That, in a, in a way, is partly right and partly not right. The right part of it that is true of how things were dealt with in the Iranian file and in the Syrian file. The other part is that it was not done by the United States of America alone. It was done by others. And I believe if there is a lesson from that exercise, uh, then it would be great if the United States of America to say, let us have a collective process similar to the other ones with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian question. It could be done by the United States of America. And I negotiate and I talk with ambassadors of all countries in the Security Council, including the permanent representatives of uh, members in the Security Council. By that, I mean Russia, China, France, uh, UK, and other important countries in Europe and uh, beyond, including, of course, the United States of America. But if the United States administration, for whatever reason, including domestic reasons, they say on this issue we are paralyzed, in my opinion, they are not demonstrating the leadership that they should and they have done so with regard to the Iranian file and to the uh, Syrian file. 
Of course, we are thankful for France that stepped up to the plate and took the initiative. And I think the assessment of France and some Europeans, maybe it is difficult on this issue for the United States to take the lead. Although they took the lead during the time when uh, Secretary of State uh, Kerry, about three years ago, spent significant time over eight months in order to help us and to help the Israeli side to move forward. But unfortunately, when he faced difficulties with the Israeli side, for example, to stop the settlement activities, U.S. administration will not move beyond appealing to, the United, to Israel and asking them to, uh, to maybe stop settlement activities. For Israel, if you just appeal to them, and if you express a position of principle such as settlements are illegal and obstacle to peace, and there are no consequences, then the Israeli government will say, okay, we take note of your statement, but we're continuing with this behavior because there is nothing happening to them in order to force them to not to continue uh, acting illegally. So therefore, what I'm saying is, it is possible that the United States of America can lead, but if we want to accept the domestic component of uh, this issue that would make it difficult for the administration, whether it's Democratic you know, administration or Republican administration, then the second best would be others to lead, to initiate, such as France and the Europeans and the Arabs, and perhaps we could pull the United States of America to be a player. Whether we pull them, whether they lead, regardless of what, but if they play, their role as a powerful global uh, country in a reasonable way, in a fair way, then we will be put on the fast track for moving in the direction of a just solution to this tragedy, to this conflict, which will be good for the Palestinian people and the state of Palestine and good for the state of Israel and the Israelis. Yes, I have a question. Uh, the present borders of the Middle East were pretty much drawn up by a couple bureaucrats, Sykes-Picot, at the end of World War I. It seems to be falling apart with the uh, war in Iraq, Iraq um, in Lebanon, in Syria, um, even with the large refugee population now in Jordan. How do you see, when all this is over, how do you see the borders changing, and how will this affect the Middle East? I think you're absolutely right, you know, and I personally have been saying for many years that we are in the stage of uh, sykes pico a new sykes pico uh, that will uh, impose itself in the Middle East. In the old sykes pico we, the Palestinian people, were gypped because in the old sykes pico there was a Belfort Declaration in which the Zionist movement was promised a national Jewish homeland for the Jews. That's the old, the f you know, the old sykes pico For us, Whatever sykes Pico, new sykes Pico that is going to unfold, we want to make sure that a national homeland for the Palestinian people on the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip to be part of the making. And we are uh, operating on such basis by having good relationship with all concerned parties, the big ones, uh, United States, Russia, China, Europeans, and the regional ones, such as Turkey, the Arab ones, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. This time we are determined we are not going to be out of the equation. We suffered enough. We demonstrated flexibility enough. And this time we are not going to be outside of the geography and the history of the Middle East. This time is the time of the state of Palestine. We deserve to have our own state. We are proud people, highly educated, reasonable, and we deserve to have our own state in Palestine next to Israel. We have history in that land. And I can show you the map of my family that dates to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years in Palestine. That's my history. When I go and walk barefoot in the valleys, the land speaks to me through my feet about the vegetation, 
and everything in that land. I have history in that land, but I demonstrated uh, uh, flexibility and compromise in accepting on my national homeland to have two states, one Israel and one the Palestinian state. But nobody can force me or coerce me into forgetting my history and connection with that, with that connection with that land. That's why we say Palestine is our national homeland. In our national homeland, two states could be established. And if one read to read, you know, Resolution 181, it says the partition of Palestine into two states. So therefore, you know, that is the history. And we hope that we can uh, succeed in this endeavor. In this new Sykes-Pico, we are not going to be out of the equation. Um, as a result of the conflict, there has been thousands of refugees in parts of Iraq and Jordan. And my question is, if the two-state solution were to be a successful solution, what would, where would the refugees be? So these are refugees that are yearning to return to their homeland. Thank you. You see, in 1948-49, two pieces of legislation at the level of the United Nations were drafted and adopted. And both of them were drafted by the United States of America. The first one was the partition plan in order to establish two states in Palestine, Resolution 181, which was adopted in 1947. The other resolution, which was drafted by the United States of America, dealt with the refugees, Resolution 194. That called for uh, the right of return and compensation. And the United States of America, through their representatives at the UN, from 1949 until 1993, the time of the Oslo Agreement, they used to reintroduce this resolution, 194, to be reiterated by the UN without the United States of America accepting another country to co-sponsor with them that resolution. So that is the history. Now, rights of refugees are individual rights. They're not collective rights of countries. Collective rights are self-determination, in which a people to exercise their right to self-determination through many things, including independence and statehood. But refugees, it's individual right. Your right to go back to your property, to your home, to where you were evicted from, or you were afraid and you ran away from that area. You have that right to return to your home and to your property, including compensation. This is, if you want, as a lawyer, this is the legal background of this issue. In terms of politics, we need to deal with these complicated issues because it is one of the six final status issues that we have to negotiate in terms of how we can address it in a realistic way. And that will be left to the negotiation. And the negotiation based on international law and UN resolutions. We do not negotiate in a vacuum. And whatever we agree to with the Israelis on this issue and in all the other issues, we are committed, and it seems to me also the Israelis declare that they are committed to putting the agreement into referendum. If the Israeli public agree to it, then whoever government that will be negotiating that issue can move ahead to implement from our side we will put it to a referendum. If the Palestinian people agree to it, then the government that will be negotiating on behalf of the Palestinian people will act on such basis. This is, this is you know, that all I can tell you now, but this, this is an issue, a very thorny, complicated issue that will be left to the details of the negotiation, and we need to negotiate it in a collective process because the Arab Peace Initiative addresses this issue in certain parts. The international community addressed it in other parts. The Security Council and the General Assembly address it through traditional resolutions. And Iraq, I mean, uh, uh, Japan, Sweden, the European countries, and the United States of America, they pay the budget of UNRWA, which is the agency that looks after the Palestine refugees on an annual basis. And the budget now is reaching $1 billion and more especially with the continuous catastrophes, not only in Israel, but also like what's happening in Syria with regard to Al Yarmouk refugee camp and in on the tragic situation of the civilian population, including the Palestine refugees. 
So therefore, all these issues will come into play when we reach the moment collectively of uh, negotiating this uh, very complicated issue. During the process of Madrid, there was a committee on refugees, and it was at that time headed by Canada. But other countries were involved in it to negotiate the uh, agreement and the, the solution with regard to the refugees, because also the host countries have claims, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. We are grateful for them for receiving us for almost 70 years and allowing us to live and providing us with services of infrastructure of their countries. So when we have a solution, also they need to be compensated for providing us with these services in their country. So it is very complicated. It's not simple, but if there is a will, yes, we want to resolve this issue, then there will be ways to do it. And by the way, the Secretary General of the United Nations proposing to convene for the first time in the history of the United Nations, a summit on humanitarian issues. It's going to happen in Istanbul, 23rd and 24th of May. Of course, he said he wants to tell leaders, you have five core responsibilities in addressing, addressing the issue of refugees, because today, the number of refugees since World War II reached 60 million individuals the highest number in history. So he said he stipulated five core responsibilities. The two, the first two ones are the most important ones. He said the first one, if leaders do not come to the summit with determination and political will to resolve conflict and to prevent conflict, then we will not be able to succeed in our exercise to resolve conflict like our conflict, which is festering for the last 70 years, and to prevent conflict, let's not have more of the Syria, Libya, Yemen, and the likes to emerge again because they bring more and more catastrophes and humanitarian tragedies. The second thing that he said, we need to show commitment to honoring and respect respecting international law, in including international humanitarian law which means that no country should be allowed to be above the law. If settlement is an illegal thing, you cannot continue with impunity to do this illegal thing. You have to stop doing it. Because if we do not manage in finding ways to convince you, Israel, to stop this illegal behavior, then we cannot resolve the Israeli-Palestinian question. So at least these are the two core responsibilities among other core responsibilities, but these are the most two important ones. Will the leaders of today, when they meet in Istanbul in that summit, elevate themselves to the level of responsibility of addressing themselves to these two issues? That is the $1 million question. We will find out in May. But if they do, then it means that they are doing something of a historical nature, that they are not going to just give general statements and business as usual. Business as usual cannot cut it. We have to change our behavior if we want not to keep killing each other and creating all these tra tragic humanitarian catastrophes. We'll see. Hi. Um, how does the separation of Jerusalem factor into all this since neither side is obviously going to surrender the city entirely? Of course, Jerusalem is a complicated issue. In fact, if one to study the uh, partition plan, it said one state became Israel, the other one, which is now struggling for its independence, the Palestinian state, and Jerusalem at that time and Bethlehem, but mainly the old city of Jerusalem to be put under international administration. And the reason why even the Americans, when they drafted, that resolution, they realize that Jerusalem, particularly the holy city, is a city for all humanity. So it cannot be manipulated by one side. And all the, posi the positions of everyone and different US administration, until now they do not accept the unilateral annexation of Israel of the holy city of Jerusalem. 
regardless of what the rhetoric would be through the election campaign. Some big shots from the South or other places of the United States running for presidential, uh, as presidential candidates. From day one, I will move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They say these things, and then when they are presidents, they realize that this is something that cannot be implemented. In fact, two countries acted illegally through this history by putting their embassies in Jerusalem. And uh, by that, I refer to Costa Rica and El Salvador. But many years ago, both of them realized that they were violating international law. They apologized for that illegal behavior and removed their embassies back to Tel Aviv because they said Jerusalem status will be resolved in the final status negotiations to be <laughs> agreed to by everyone as to exactly what will be the final uh, status of Jerusalem. But of course, Jerusalem was occupied in the 4th of June of 1967. Israel is the only country that unilaterally and illegally declared uh, you know, uh, the annexation of Jerusalem. Even inside Israel, they are divided on that issue. But from the point of view of international law, from the point of view of the position of all countries, including the US administration, uh, they do not accept this illegal Israeli unilateral action vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. Uh, you've responded to the refugee question. I would just like to know, what do you think of the immigration policy between Palestine and the United States at this time? Somebody wa uh, told me the other day that this quota system might still in, in existence of the drawing, the, the 200 that I referred to in which my father was among the lucky ones and did benefit from it. But uh, I think that uh, the immigration policy of the United States over the years became more and more difficult. I remember that when I was young, my father, it was easier for him to bring his uh, sisters, his brothers, and their offsprings. And in fact, my father who came to this country almost 60 some years ago, the offspring from his extended family, there are almost 250 in the United States of America, which I think that this is the typical story of all Americans. Somebody came from Italy, brought, brought the relatives, and the relatives brought other relatives, and before you know it, you have a tribe. <laughs> and, and from India, from Pakistan, from the UK, from Ireland, from Beit Hanina in Palestine, from all these places, you know. It's just like you bring one family, and uh, you know that the immigrants are amazing, you know, that they try, they improvise, you know, they bring other relatives, and before you, you know it, you have a colony in, in Cleveland, Ohio, from the Halabi family, for example, or from uh, another family, you know, from this uh, country or that country. This, this, this is the story of the United States of, uh, of America. But my understanding now that there are more restrictions now, it's not as easy as, as it used to be, and also, I know from history books between World War I and World War II, the United States of America had a very flexible uh, you know, immigration policy in which 50 million were received from abroad to be part of the United States of America. And in fact, when, with regard to the, the Jewish question, while Jews from Eastern Europe had difficulties going to Western Europe, the United States of America was the only country that was, that had open policy to absorb as many of them as they wish, and that's why millions of Jews from Eastern Europe, including from uh, the, uh, the former Soviet Union and Russia, came to the United States of America. So while the UK, for example, that crafted the Belfort Declaration, they were more restrictive at that time in accepting Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe to the UK, and for them, in addition to religious uh, reasons of the Puritans, and you know their thinking, and they said, let's send the Jews from Eastern Europe to Palestine, not to bring them to the UK. But the United States of America was very generous, was very helpful to everyone, including the Jews, including, you know, the many from uh, different uh, European countries, Italians, Irish, you name it, and later on, uh, Arabs, Indians, Pakistanis, from uh, all uh, continents. And even, you know, I was listening to the debate yesterday 
of uh, Mr. Trump now is interested in the brain drain, which was always the case. He said that those very smart engineers and scientists coming from, uh, uh, let's say, from India, from Pakistan, from the Arab countries, from, from the third world countries, who are studying in the United States or working in the United States, he is showing flexibility in terms of their immigration processes because he wants to keep them because he said that they are good for business. Thank you. Is this the last question? That's it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have enjoyed a Friday Forum featuring Ambassador Riyad Mansour. Ambassador Mansour appears today as part of the City Club's annual forum on civil liberties made possible by a special memorial gift from David Ralph Hertz's widow, Marguerite Rosenberg Hertz, his sons Harlan and Willard, and a host of friends, including a significant contribution by David Myers and the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. We thank all of you for your support. And we also give special thanks to today's table sponsors, Berzite Society, Care of Cleveland, Friends of Care, and the Northeast Ohio Consortium for Middle East Studies. Student participation from Hawkins School was made possible by the Law Foundation. Our hospitality partner is a Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We thank you all for your support. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation and engagement. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.